Welcome, and thank you for joining us in our iTrek virtual ideation competition. We're excited to have participants that truly span the globe from the US to Israel to China uh, this, this afternoon, this morning, or this evening, depending on where you are. The iTrek program at Cornell Tech is a key embodiment of the academic partnership between Cornell Tech and the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. Uh, specifically, iTrek brings together students from Cornell Tech and the Technion uh, to actively pursue a joint academic challenge. Students begin their work in the fall semester with the introduction of prompts that are sponsored by Ikilov Hospital uh, and are written and managed by MindState. The student teams conduct rigorous research on the topic, consulting with hospital staff, speaking with entrepreneurs and experts, and operating independently up through the ideation sprint, which took place this week. As Dean and Vice Provost of Cornell Tech last year, I got to travel with the uh, Cornell Tech students to Israel and witness firsthand the hard work and energy and time that the students pour into these projects. Of course, those students had the luxury of working face-to-face -face in this uh, pre-pandemic world. This year, of course, the mixed teams of Cornell Tech, Technion, and uh, uh, designer students were presented with the additional challenge of having to do everything online and across several different time zones. I'm delighted to see that they're through creativity, innovation, passion, and patience, they rose to this challenge. And we're excited and proud, frankly, to showcase the hard work and energy they put in these past few months, and in particular, this past uh, couple of days. In today's program, you'll see the final pitches of the 12 teams, each working on one of seven prompts that feature a real challenge within the domain of hospitals and healthcare. Of course, now more than ever, uh, it's important to recognize the significance of hospital health and wellness innovation and the role of emerging technologies in that innovation. I wanna thank our partners at the Technion, at Ikilov Hospital and MindState, and hope that you enjoy the show. MindState is a platform of bringing together physicians with bright ideas, designers with bright ideas, and then people from sciences all together in the task of reinventing medicine, reinventing the way that we are diagnosing, treating, and operating. The collaboration of thinking creates innovation in a high scale. We are setting here an example. Keep on, keep on innovation because this is the way to advance medicine even in the time of epidemic and pandemic. Welcome, Shalom, uh, Erev Tov. So here we are. Um, after many months, this, this whole process, is quickly reiterate, started in the summer of 2020, when MindState defined the first prompts together with Ifilov. In late October, we all got together for the first time and we introduced the prompts. In November and December, we did a couple of conferences that really focused on research. And all of that has now accumulated in the last few days where we did the actual ideation sprint. And of course, we'll do the judging and the awards. So after much researching and learning and ideating and testing and critiquing, and I'm sure some arguing and negotiating and pivoting, then of course there was the decision-making and it all has now resulted into, you know, the moment to, the moment has arrived to, for you guys to show off all the hard work that you put into this. Um, before we do that though, I want to say on a personal note how, actually really how proud and how impressed I have been with how you guys have been working together. I know my keyword in all these uh, events has been collaboration and it truly has been amazing to see you guys work together. And I don't need to remind anyone how difficult the circumstances have been. So I really want to applaud you guys for that. Um, I love, by the way, how we then all got together these last few days on Gather Town. And that became our small city and it was just really fun to see ourselves running around like little avatars so it was quite the experience i have to say and and of course there's you know there's nothing um nothing better there's there's no more energy than when you're together in an actual space but on the other hand i have to say that the virtual vitality and really passion that i've seen over these last few days in my opinion are really a testament to how all of you decided you know, to, to go for this. Um, 
it's, uh, you know, it, it really, for me, it's like your collective frame of mind when you decided to be a participant in this tells me that you were not going to be defied by the pandemic, but that you really were going to push even harder. So in that respect, I think I'm really impressed, as I said. And actually, one student mentioned to me, she said, I had no idea that in such a short amount of time, I could do so much work, which is exactly what this is all about. Um, as, as both Greg and, and Ronnie also mentioned, you know, it is absolutely clear that healthcare is more important than ever, um, you know, to civilization at large, to communities, to all of us as individuals. And I think on that, on, in that respect, I think we should all be proud having been part of this. So in my book, you already are all winners. That said, of course, it is a competition. So we now have to find out which teams will rise to the top. And, and to do that, we're gonna look at presentations. So there will be 12 teams that will be presenting today. They will have responded to eight different prompts. All of that, as I said, accumulated in the past three days with the ideation sprint. I'm sure there have been untold cups of coffee that have been consumed and it will result in one winner. We have great and esteemed judges to help us with the evaluation process. So Ronnie Gamzu, whom you just saw, he is the CEO of Tel Aviv Sarasky Medical Center, also called Ichilov. Um, he's been part of this for a number of years and has been a great supporter behind the scenes. Uh, we also have with us Aviv Shoher, who is the CEO of Ichilov Tech. We have Lila Weiss, who is the Director of Innovation at Ichilov. Kai Gamzu, whom I just saw coming by here. Uh, Angel Investor also has been a part of MindState and several of these ideation sprints for several years. Um, we have with us Ariel Orda, who is the head of the Jacobs program at Technium, and also Greg Morissette, whom we just saw, the dean and the vice provost of Cornell Tech. Both Ariel and Greg were with us last year as well, so they have a good sense of what is happening. Um, we have Joachim Behar with us. Many of you have worked with him through this ideation sprint. He is, he is an assistant professor at Technion and also the director of AIM Lab. And we have also Roy Wiesner, who is a partner at AIMON, and also gave a presentation in one of our research um, conferences. New this year is that we also have asked the students and the designers to cast their vote and their collective vote will count as one vote, you know, together with the eight votes of our judges. Okay, very quickly, I think everybody is aware of the procedure now, but just as a quick reminder. So we're going to be looking at pre-recorded presentation pitches. They will be no more than five minutes. Thereafter, we will have a five minute question and answer session. Um, only the judge, so that will be, all be live. Um, the judges will be the only people who can ask live questions, but anyone else in the chat can, you know, share thoughts, responses, ask questions as well. And so that the teams may respond to that later on. I will also say that, you know, um, I will be the arbiter in this process. So I'm going to uh, apologize beforehand, but I'm going to be quite strict. We really only have the five minutes had to ask the questions and get some answers. Many of you have other responsibilities, important responsibilities. So we do want to make sure that we end in time. And there will also be a countdown clock so everybody can see how the five minutes progress. Um, lastly, we have a rank choice voting system, which means that as we go through the process, judges and the students and the designers can um, rank the different teams. And at the end of the whole process, you know, one team will have risen to the top and the second and the third one, of course, as well. It will all be automatic in that respect, so it will be a purely democratic vote. We're then going to take about 25 minutes as a short break to make sure that all the tallying has worked out. And um, yeah, with that, I would say, um, let's get the show on the road that the best project may win and let's do this. Before we start, our design team would like to dedicate this project project to Eyal Kimchi, our friend, mentor, and leader. Eight months ago, Eyal passed away suddenly from a heart attack. While, he, while the solution you're about to see wouldn't have helped him, we hope he can help the millions of people who experience heart attacks every year. Hi everyone, we at Libya are excited to share a product that aims to make cardiac rehab more accessible and available to patients with chronic heart conditions. A heart attack can strike out of nowhere. Take Helen, she's an average woman, has some stress at work, her cholesterol could be better, but overall she keeps healthy. That is until she suffered a heart attack. She was hospitalized and left with a stent in her heart and a long to-do list in her hand. What now? 
Recovering from heart attack isn't simple. Helen has to start rehab, change her lifestyle, take new medications, make new appointments, and she's anxious about getting sick all over again. All she wants is to feel normal again. Rehab centers don't have capacity to take every patient that needs their care. Waiting lists are very long for new and follow-up patients. In fact, most patients offered rehab don't do it. COVID has made it even harder to get patients into the clinic. If Helen does not adhere to her treatments and keep track of her health, she's likely to become one out of five patients who have a second heart attack within five years. She would end up right back in the hospital. Rehospitalization is extremely stressful and dangerous for patients. It is costly. And for hospitals, it leads to penalties, hurts quality of care, and puts pressure on overwhelm systems. Helen is one of the 800,000 people who have a heart attack each year in the US. So how do we help her? Meet Libby, the world's first digital heart rehab coordinator. Is everything your patient needs for cardio rehab from their phone and more importantly, their home? Libby is the whole package. We make sure patients receive everything they need for their recovery. Libby connects to health patient health record after they are assessed in the rehab center. Then Libby sends personalized content to the patient to monitor, motivate, and educate. To close the loop, the care team gets regular updates to follow the patient's progress and vital signs and are informed of any unusual events. Now let's see Libby in action. A member of the care team at the rehab center will onboard the patient to Libby using a dedicated tablet and then help them download the Libby app. With a friendly conversational interface, gamification, and bit-by-bit -bit onboarding, Libby helps patients feel in control of their health. In addition to getting information from the EHR, Libby uses the patient's answers to personalize the interface and treatment plan. And this is the last step, where patients can track and see their rehab all in one place. And of course, when patients go back home, Libby comes along. They'll get push notifications to remind them about medication, exercise, and appointments, and to keep them motivated. In the app, Libby keeps track of patient adherence. Interactions with Libby are like a running conversation. Patients can, can answer her and get friendly updates or nudges depending on their progress and behavior. Libby connects patients to their care team and can also connect them to other rehab patients around them for support and company. And in addition to everything, we've included an emergency button at the top that calls 911 if the patient has a medical emergency while using Libby. Patients can get an overview of how they are doing, see upcoming appointments, and dive into any parts to see their progress. These dashboards are where they can get a snapshot of their status and progress over time. Libby adds context to their measurements and progress to motivate and educate them. The care team gets real-time information through a simple web interface and the patient's EHR. Libby goes far beyond what is possible through in-person appointments. It bridges the gap for remote rehab patients, increasing motivation and adherence, and keeping them connected to the care team. While there are other early remote rehab and telehealth solutions beginning to emerge, Lib is the only personalized chatbot for education and monitoring covering everything patients need. Libby helps hospitals and rehab centers treat more people more efficiently, thereby promoting lifestyle changes and increasing adherence, which reduces the risk of a second heart attack and readmission. Through increased accessibility of cardiac rehab, U.S. hospitals can save up to $128 million a year. Looking ahead, Libby can be easily adjusted to fit nearly every chronic health condition. We will start by focusing on heart health, then expand to diabetes, COPD, and cancer. Thanks for listening to our pitch, and we're looking forward to any questions you might have. Great. Thank you so much, guys. That was excellent. Um, I forgot to mention, so for the judges, they can raise uh, their hands digitally. And at that point, I can see who may have a question. And I know some of the judges are also in a space at Ichilov. Um, you can, of course, also do it digitally or Tamar can let us know if there is a particular question. Yes, uh, I see Guy, Guy Gamzu, go ahead. Hi. Um... 
Quick question. What does the, uh, the kit contain? Yeah, basically, it depends on what the doctor will prescribe uh, to the patient when he's uh, discharged from the hospital. If he has uh, a need to monitor his uh, blood pressure, will maybe um, uh, include it. Or if uh, he's diagnosed with high cholesterol and so new diagnosis, um, you have to to um, to have uh, all to, to to monitor. Thank you. Did you consider um, smartwatch? Because I think they they measure quite a lot of the ingredients that you mentioned, whether it's heart rate, blood pressure, uh, fitness parameters, sleep, etc. Yeah, obviously, this is uh, written on the on the package. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Thank you, Guy. Um, any of the other judges who may have a question? Or a thought? Okay, that's, that's always a good sign. It must have been a good presentation. Um, do you guys, the students, you, as we have a few minutes left here, do you have any final thought or observation you might want to share? Greg, sorry, Greg, I see your hand, go ahead. Hey, just a quick question about the, uh, the claim around uh, rehab availability. Do you know pre-pandemic what, what that was like? Uh, what, so any data to support that claim? Yeah, I can take this one, Greg. Um, so generally speaking, I think based on CDC data that we found pre-pandemic, uh, rehab attendance was around uh, one third, 33%. And we know from a Japanese study actually during the current COVID pandemic uh, with the availability of remote rehabilitation in their country, uh, there was actually a 60% increase in rehab participation uh, during during this year alone. So that alone shows some of the potential and power by increasing the accessibility of cardiac rehabilitation. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, another question quickly. Um, why uh, this particular market or approach as opposed or disease as opposed to diabetes or something else? Yeah, so, so one, oh, go ahead. Yeah, because we're addressing uh, people that are already um, diagnosed and that are released from the hospital. But as uh, uh, Steve may uh, t talk to you, um, it, it's another idea to expand it to chronic conditions like diabetes or blood pressure before uh, being hospitalized. If Steve, uh, you want to add something. Yeah, and one more thing, Greg. Um, I know here in the US specifically, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they have a program called Hospital Readmissions Reduction Program, HRRP. And that whole program is centered around preventing and reducing the number of readmissions for key chronic conditions, including heart attacks and heart failure. So that was a huge reason as well why from a value proposition perspective, we decided to focus on the cardiac rehab space first and really prove that out in this initial market space before we start expanding to other chronic illnesses. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we have about a minute left. I see Joachim had a question too. Joachim, go ahead. Hey, thanks guys, very nice presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding the, the data you intend to record um, on a daily basis at least. Um, do you see this as uh, data that would be looked at by the doctor or do you, are you considering some uh, automated analysis of this and the trend of the vital signs, for example, you would be recording? Um, so we were thinking of uh, having some kind of uh, automatic filter according to what the caregivers uh, would like to see and wouldn't, uh, wouldn't need to see because certain things can be um, pretty general for patients. But also, we were thinking of um, sending, uh, for example, weekly reports or daily reports to the main caregiver of certain um, statistics that he might want to keep track of for all the patients together. And uh, also, there are checkups that have to be uh, with the caregiver. So at that time, he can see all the patient's information. Does that answer? Yes, thank you.
Let's talk about cardiac arrest. According to the World Health Organization, cardiovascular diseases are number one cause of death globally. Think about the people around you. Every 40 seconds, a person dies from a cardiac arrest in the US only, and 80% of the cases happen at home. Four minutes after a cardiac arrest, a brain damage starts to occur if no treatment received. Automatic external defibrillator, or AED, is a device that restores a normal heartbeat by sending an electrical shock to the heart. AEDs are present in public places with more than 300 people, but only at 6% of the cases, AED was reported as available. Only at 3%, a rescuer was sent to get the AED, and at only 1%, an AED device is actually found, which means that most of the patients don't receive effective treatment in time. New USB-powered delivery and larger capacity cell phones batteries are allow our product to revolutionize the AED industry. To transform this big, expensive and inaccessible plastic defibrillator to a new and improved device. Introducing DEFI, a smart and portable defibrillator. It will connect to a cell phone and start to charge immediately. Once sticky pads are attached to the patient, ECG signals will be recorded and analyzed. Based on that, DEFI will decide if the shock is advised. If the device is being charged, CPR instructions will be shown on the phone screen. Once it's ready, a shock will be available. With DEFI, instead of panicking, a patient will get quick and effective treatment by any person in his surroundings. DEFI will increase the chances of survival and will prevent irreparable damage. Your phone battery is strong enough to supply the required amount of energy for multiple electric shocks. One shock requires no more than 1.2% of the battery. Besides, DEFI will also be able to save and share ECG data with the medical staff, send a GPS signal to the emergency services, and also provide clear CPR instructions in real time. If for any reasons DEFI won't be in instant reach, the app will alert users around you for help. DEFI will be a quick solution, accessible, and most importantly, it will save lives. Our product is made from two parts, the software which analyzes the ECG signal and decides whether to give the shock or not, and the hardware which generates the shock. We will use a new protocol that supports 15 watts of energy delivery. It supports almost every phone that has been launched in the past two to three years. By using this protocol, we figured out a way to make it possible to create a simulated prototype for a proof of concept. A capacitor which gives electric pulse will be charged in less than 17 seconds. Here we present our preliminary design for a minimal viable product. The software contains the user interface and an algorithm which will determine if an electric shock is needed, similar to those we found in other AED on the market. In the future, we want to minimize the size of this prototype and to develop a finalized product. The global external defibrillator market is soaring. To be precise, it's predicted to reach a market size of nearly 6,500 million by the end of 2026. According to the American Heart Association, 42% of the U.S. population will have some form of cardiovascular disease by 2023. And with a target price of $200 and the predicted market penetration of 2%, the revenue of DEFI could reach approximately half a billion. There are several potential competitors on the market right now, which aim to create smaller and more portable AEDs, but none of them are as compact or accessible as DEFI. From the roadmap, we can see approval from FDA is very critical. We have started the development of our MVP, and we plan to get the market approval from FDA in 18 months. Finally, we hope to launch our product in August 2022. Thank you for listening and for the opportunity. We would like to say special thanks to Eyal Kellner and Yorona Bell from Ichilov for the consultants and advisors during all stages, to our great designers, 
Vera Oren and Enad from Climacell for the dedication help and to the people in Mindstat that made this event possible. Thank you so much, guys. Really good as well. Um, yeah, five minutes for questions. Uh, Greg, see your hand. So uh, it looked like in the demo you were going to provide a map to the nearest defibrillator, if possible. Is that is that was that part of the plan? And if so, how how do you track that? So our plan was uh, to make this like to make it like sort of a community a community. So so if you have the app on your phone, someone will send an distress uh, like an SOS, and if someone around him will have deaf it. So we will be able to walk quickly to him. Okay. Um, Ariel? Well, very interesting. Uh, now, you mentioned uh, that anybody could administer this treatment. However, people, common people might hesitate to administer a, an electrical shock to another person. Maybe you could think about uh, a, a uh, adding a tutorial for family members or close people so that they can uh, uh, less hesitate in, uh, in real time. That was a suggestion. I don't know if you thought about it. Yeah, so um, we actually thought about, since, since it's um, applying electrical shocks onto the heart, people might be hesitant to, to use it, just like any other AEDs on the market at the, at the moment as well. So we plan to work with hospitals and uh, medical um, institutions to provide free training, as well as to get people uh, familiar with our product. And with the app, we can promote this up to uh, the next level. So this is our current plan to get, familiar with, uh, to get people familiar with our product at the moment. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. And uh, Guy, you had a question too? Yes, uh, thank you for the, for the presentation, uh, great one. Uh, really, really well done. So three questions actually. One, uh, any reason you don't pre-charge the device? Why just charging it from the phone? Second question, what is the cost and what would be the, the price? How, do, how this price compares to competition? And third, what kind of investment do you need in order to get to the MVP? I will take this question. So uh, about the charging, the whole idea is that the product will be disconnected from your phone most of the time. It will be on your bag or, or in a drawer in your house, and you will only connect it in the time of need. Uh, secondly, we estimate uh, the manufacturing cost for one product and about $50 when we are looking at the shelf prices for the components. Uh, it's hard to estimate right now how much money will cost uh, the clinical trials for the FDA approval and the production development time. Um, yeah, so I think the final cost to be something between 150 to $200, the cost to the end user. Yeah, and um, I kind of want to add one point is that um, uh, we actually distributed a questionnaire to ask people like how much they are willing to pay for a device like this. And the, the answer is that we, uh, they actually accept, um, the, the, the majority of the people actually accept the price um, below $300. So our target price for now is, is, um, is higher than the estimated cost, which is $50 and below the um, acceptable price for the customers, which is 300. So our target price for this product is like around 200 for now. This is actually the one that we use to calculate the revenue. I will add that uh, right now our competition sell the products uh, in the range of three thousand to five hundred dollars, and we are planning to sell it much much cheaper and then to make it more available. Yeah, and that's why that's why uh, because the majority of people actually uh, the cases are happens at home, right? So uh, we we'll make it really cheap so that every um, every family can have it as like a daily tool to keep it at home just in case anything happens. This is something that AED cannot do because uh, because AED is really expensive for a family to have. So that's why, yeah, I think um, this is it, like like sort of market uh, penetration. 
Great. Okay, I think hopefully guy that answered your immediate questions. Um, I, I urge everybody for more thoughts, questions, put it in the chat, guys. We can respond to it that way as well, of course. Cleo, reimagining the inpatient care experience. 40,000 patients get admitted every day. As a result, nurses can only afford 30 minutes of direct care per patient each day. The question is, what happens in those 30 minutes? There are three components to nursing care. Missing any one of them leads to missed care. Administered treatment, document treatment, and communication with patients. Interestingly, we found that nurses most often prioritize components one and two, simply because there's not enough time. Patients today rely on internet searches, relentless pressing the call button for help, the family members to solve the miscommunication they face. Unfortunately, none of them are credible solutions or resources. We knew that we had to step in and solve the problem of miscommunication in healthcare. Which is why we came up with Theo. Theo is a mobile app available to every patient that provides them with the information that they need when they need it. Integrated with the hospital's knowledge base and the MR, it can educate, communicate, and monitor patient conditions. Our goal is to help hospitals go from providing great treatment to providing great experiences. Let's meet one of our users, Grace, who has been admitted to the hospital for appendicitis. Grace has instant clarity and confidence on what she can expect for the next five days through a personal schedule provided by Theo. Further, Grace no longer needs to constantly nudge her nurse to ask about her treatment, lab results, or minor issues like what's my routine. She's able to learn about her treatment plans through the bite-sized video guides without needing to randomly search the net. Physical assistance requests used to take hours to receive because there's always confusion as to what the patient wants and who should serve the patient. But with Theo, Grace can easily replace her IV or get a pillow using the chatbot, which routes her request to the correct personnel. The staff are able to view this information conveniently on existing patient monitoring TVs in the ward. In other words, we are finally freeing up the emergency button for actual emergencies. After receiving the treatment, Theo checks in with Grace to see how she is doing after her stay at the hospital. The app will send a push notification to check if Grace has been completing what the doctor asked of her post-discharge and if she is feeling any pain to identify if there are any complications that arose after her surgery. This way she feels that someone is with her and we make sure she doesn't fall between the cracks. Putting it all together, every time Grace interacts with Theo through one of its features, Theo analyzes, summarizes, and updates Grace's EMR profile in real time with useful notes and suggestions, which can then be used by nurses to provide better care. With Theo, patients move from uncertainty to feeling empowered. Hospitals get higher visibility on patient experiences and better patient satisfaction scores, thus creating a brand value for trusted medical care. Nurses too, can now better utilize those 30 minutes. We're targeting the 6,200 hospitals in Israel and the US with inpatient care facilities. By licensing our app with pricing based on hospital size, we hope to capture 3% or $2.9 billion of the patient side technology market. At Theo, we're not replacing EHR systems, but integrating them to allow rich communication with patients. We also provide specific suggestions to improving inpatient care, which other machine learning powered apps are not currently doing. Also, we carefully ensured that our solution taps into the existing monitoring screens so that there, there is a low learning curve and nurses are not overburdened. Once we get our pilot up and running in Ichlov, we will explore additional features that allow patients to customize their hospital stay and study ways that allow hospitals to provide better care through our app. We aim to sign up 375 hospitals in our initial markets by 2025 with an estimated revenue of $28 million. 
Thank you. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, any questions from the judges? Yes, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering what sort of protects you from others imitating your solution? Um, I will take this. Um, actually, our integration uh, with the EHR and the work with the hospital uh, should help us uh, differ from uh, other products. Um, uh, and we in the in the future uh, we do wish uh, to put uh, more advanced um, advanced um, advanced maybe algorithm for AI and uh, to. Um, to do better uh, examination in the data and, and data anal analyze, uh, but mainly our work with the hospitals and communicating and communicating between the, the nurses and the medical staff and the patient. Thank you. When you have uh, you have different procedures, so how do you how do you plan for that? I mean, how do you know in advance what kind of procedure the patient is going to go through in order to build this calendar, and how do you build the content for the variety of cases? Sure, uh, I could take that. Thanks for the question. So right now, this information is actually available from the EMR or EHR system, depending on the hospital. And this information is easily extractable from the database. So we will have information about the basic treatment plan and the, the different procedures that the patient will undergo. And depending on the hospital, such as at, at ICHLOF, they actually have certain video guides to specific procedures. And other hospitals do have knowledge bases that we can tap into to explain how these different procedures work. So we both have access to the types of procedures for each patient, as well as credible sources of information as to how to explain these different treatment plans to different patients. What, what do you do when it changes? I mean, it's very often that you can't really foresee all the details of the procedure. Definitely. Um, as we explained a little bit, or we touched on a little bit in the technology slide, it syncs, automatic, it syncs in real time with the EMR system. So the hope is really to provide clarity to the patient by ensuring that all changes in the EMR reflects accurately on the schedule and they're notified on it about it through push notifications. So, that, so it definitely will help us um, to sync in real time with the AMR database, which is the plan. So I have a question. Um, uh, so quickly, uh, uh, when, when my wife goes to the hospital, she's scared to bring her phone because she's afraid it's gonna get stolen or worried about charging it. Uh, so an alternative would be to have a device that sits in the room in the hospital that replaces the emergency call button as opposed to the individual's phone. Have, did you consider that? Thanks, Greg. Uh, we definitely considered that, but it does appear that the emergency call button is there for a purpose, and it definitely is for um, relevant emergencies. And our hope really was not to replace the call button as it is because of the specific functions that it serves in every ward, but it really was to um, ensure that requests such as changing a pillow or helping the patient get to the toilet is easily replaced and conducted by nursing aides that are in hospitals who are different from nurses who actually are in charge of emergencies. So we want to ensure that emergency buttons are used by nurses and our chatbot feature will decide, um, you know, which relevant tasks will be routed towards the nursing aides who will help with the simpler task and which emergencies should be left at emergency button, in which case the app will inform the patient to use the emergency button instead. And um, in terms of usage of mobile phones, we decided that um, most inpatients who are there for a long period of time actually do bring their mobile phones, at least 60 to 70% of them do. And hence, we thought it would be much more useful for us to tap into that than provide new tablets that they might have to learn how to use. Yachim, you have a quick question? A yeah, quick question regarding the uh, EHR or EMR. Um, obviously, hospitals are using different technologies. How do you uh, aim to integrate um, between these very, very different technologies? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, thanks so much for that. So um, Chameleon is probably the most widely used in, in Israel. So we understand, and that is what we'll be going for in Israel. And likewise, I think Epic and Athena Health hold about 60 to 70% of the market. So those are the two EHR systems that we'll try to integrate with first before moving on to smaller and more complicated or different EHR systems. 
Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Beautiful. Meet Jessica. Jessica has been staying at a ward for several days now. She is not feeling well for quite some time. Her arm is hurting. Blood is oozing from her bandage, and it needs to be changed. Meanwhile, Amy, her nurse, is busy preparing medication for another patient. She has 70 patients assigned to her at the same time. Amy is overwhelmed with work right now. Texts being handed off to her every minute through the EMR system, text messages, and even just thrown to the air across the ward. She turns to write something down on a note she has been carrying since her shift started. But wait, where is it? She can't find it anywhere. Amy knows that she has a lot of tasks to do, but now with her notes gone, what does she even begin with? If only Amy had a platform that could help her manage the tasks and make sure nothing slips through the cracks. That is where we come in. Let us introduce a word to you. Our goal is to offload processes and help nurses prioritize tasks, automate routine and new test transfers, minimize unnecessary information exchange within the staff, and make better use of the personnel so that it's lower costs. And on the bottom line, assist the nurses to operate in a more human-centric manner. Now, with the help of a word, Amy could check out her next test immediately on her mobile. No need to run around the ward, no worries for losing notes. The tests and the information of the patients are now at the palm of Amy's hand. She now sees all of her tests, seven at a moment, on her nurse page. These are sorted by severity by default. Amy now could easily notice that Jessica, her patient, needs a band changing as soon as possible. This is the most important test she has right now. And she marks the test status as closed. Jessica feels better, physically, but most importantly, mentally. She can ask Amy about her medical status and next procedures. Navigating to Jessica's patient page, Amy tells Jessica that she would have the bandage changed every day at 4 p.m. for the following days. Before she comes out of the room, Amy is trying to understand what is the next text in hand, no longer having to deal with WhatsApp messages or texts mentioned by daughter as she moves along. She opens up her patient page and sees what needs to be done. She noted that another patient of hers, Wade, who is in the bed next to Jessica, also needs immediate care. At the same time, she assigns a belated urgent test to another nurse on the same shift to follow up, which the other nurse is notified at the exact moment about it. Just minutes later, Amy has taken care of Wade and comes back to Jessica with her medication. Jessica is asking Amy if the bandage could be replaced more frequently. Referring to the doctor for permission, she creates a new recurring test for that matter. She sets a reminder and ensures Jessica about the arrangement. Amy leaves a voice note in her test informing updates for a nurse to come in on the next shift. Others, including nurses in charge and executives, could view all of the information via mobile or on their own desktops. Amy now knows that she has one unified platform designed for her as a nurse with all the information she needs in order to perform her daily tasks in the best way possible. She is no longer worried about missing things or wasting time figuring out tasks and feels she could use the time to be with her patients. At Award, we are aware that there is competition in our field of interest, but none quite address the problem as we do, tailor-made for nursing. The costs of delayed care and miscommunication are very real. On the conservative side, it accounts for more than 140,000 deaths representing 5% of deaths annually. This is important, not only generally, but the hospitals in particular, as mortality rate is one of the KPIs that are used in determining a hospital's ranking and funding. On top of this, the financial burden of malpractice insurance due to this missed care accounts for over $120 per patient and $55 billion annually. At Yale New Haven Hospital, an average delay of care of a mere 15 minutes in transfer patients caused a 24% increase in costs and when remedied, saved $3.5 million over 90 days. The need is clearly there. For our pilot at Ichilov, we will show that AWARD reduces delayed care and will use this proof of concept to market to other hospitals and insurance companies. We plan on selling a full service application with a fee structure on a per bed basis with discounts for larger hospitals. As a hospital designated product, we know the feedback from the field is our best guidance. Our plan is having a pilot with an increasing number of wards in Ichilo to allow healthy growth and high touch with the professionals in the hospital. Concrete results will be brought to other hospitals and serve as POC for the worldwide early adopters. Clear dashboards can bring a bright insight to management at any level, both on day-to-day -day and wide-term performance, and support better decision-making. We are fully aware of the importance of the data. Information security is like a religion to us, and we are compliant with all major standards in the market. At last, special thanks to our honorable mentors, Karen and Elena.
We believe that by choosing a word, you invest in us as much as you invest in the product. As a mix of people from across the world with a feel for design, product, development and more, we make a great candidate to lift this venture up to the sky and beyond. So now, a word from you. Beautiful, enthusiastic ending. Who has a question? Come on, guys. It, it, it doesn't make sense when we're that good. You got to have some questions. <laughs> All right. I have one, Hank. This is Abhi yeah, from Mutual of Tech. Uh, I have... Can you please uh, just uh, speak a little closer to the mic? Sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, congrats for a very compelling pitch. Um, what, what I'm interested in is what do you find proprietary or unique in your product design or architecture that would make it a barrier for the likes of Chameleon or Epic to create this as, a day on, as an add-on by themselves? So um, from our experience by uh, visiting Gikilov and talking to the nurses, um, the Chameleon isn't um, focusing the, about the nurses and their daily routine, but uh, more of uh, allowing the, uh, the headquarters to, to get really nice uh, uh, ins I mean, reports and insights, but uh, the nurses hates it, hates them. And uh, we, we try to be the, the hospital's operating system. Um, we just, from one visit or two visits, you, you can see that uh, tasks are just um, forwarded across the hallway without any monitoring or documentation and can be easily missed. And um, the handoffs are not being done with any method. And we felt like that's a unmet need. We need to, we need it and, and able to answer. I have a question. Uh, first, uh, regarding the product, how do you make sure that this is not something that will have to influence the nurse in terms of habit? I mean, if they have, if they already have their own way to do things, they now need to do a different process. So I would love to hear your point on that. And second, how much of an investment and what is the timeline to actually come out with a product? Okay, so I'll start with the second one, just because yeah, I think it's shorter due to the, to the nature of the business. And as we said, we're dealing with patients information and uh, uh, hospital system, which uh, requires really high reliability and security. So the cost is estimated by $200,000 uh, uh, $200, for developing a uh, working uh, front and back end app. Um, and uh, we believe it can be done within about uh, six months. Um, and then we would like to have some decent pilot with Ikilov just to make sure that uh, we launch the product widely um, with a very good product uh, because it's much easier in Ikilov that we can be in high touch. Um, uh, uh, and uh, can you remind me the first one? I just, uh, the, the first question was about the nurses uh, something? About what uh, the, the nurses are now accustomed to, whether you, you think it's going to be easy for them to adopting a certain routine to actually log in every task and so forth to do like task management? So first of all, now there is no uh, protocol or unique system whatsoever. I mean, every nurse has her own uh, uh, board or, or uh, papers that she takes her notes and just think about the handoffs. I mean, um, as we come from the tech world, I would never like to work like that. Uh, the uh, tests are just uh, thrown at me. Um, so we believe that with a very light but precise uh, interface, um, we trust the stickiness that it, they will just feel it's better. They get it better um, and they can forward it better to the following errors on handoffs and uh, uh, just managing the resources of the, of the port. Hi, uh, this is Ronnie Gamzo. I just want to ask uh, a question, or maybe to adjust your solution mm -hmm. to the, you know, to the routines and to real life. Uh, some or most of the nurses 
will do the you know routines and to do the task going all around the department with a um, with a mobile computer on a cart and this is what they are doing uh, not only in Ikhilo but but elsewhere in many many uh, medical departments so your solution shouldn't be only on mobiles it should also be on the laptops that are going in and around all the around the department and showing them the tasks may I, may I answer um, just yes please Sure. So first of all, it's uh, both uh, uh, mobile and uh, PC compliant. It has the web, uh, web interface, just like you said. And from our experience at the work, they do have the computers on the carts, um, but, uh, but they, they don't necessarily go straight to the computer after every test. That's one of the problems. So we, our solution allows them to document the, the test that they've just completed uh, in a precise way before they forget it and, and then uh, check it in the computer once they can. Okay, um, so this is the moment where I have to be strict. We've gonna run a little bit over time, so I'm gonna cut it off here. Joachim, I see you have a question, but if you don't mind, put it in the chat for now, and then um, you know we can answer it that way. So thank you so much, guys. Hi, where's Ariz? Meet Elizabeth. Elizabeth has been waiting in the ED for three hours and 31 minutes. Did you know that staying over four hours in the ED leads to an increase in patients' mortality rate? There are millions of Elizabeths worldwide. 15 million of 140 million ED visits in the US result in hospital admission. This represents 65% of total hospital admissions. This is the process that Elizabeth has to go through in the emergency department. We noticed a key bottleneck from the moment the doctor decides to admit a patient until the patient is transferred in the relevant wing. This has grave consequences. 5,449 people have lost their lives as a direct result of waiting between 6 and 11 hours for admission between 2016 and 2019. This is purely unacceptable. The waiting time has great financial consequences as well. One hour of ED boarding per patient per, per day leads to $28 billion in loss of potential revenue. Why is this taking so long? In Ikhilov, 400 patients enter the ED daily. Avi Cohen, the nurse, has to make phone calls for every single patient that's admitted. These phone calls get responses such as, we're busy now, we're overbooked, call back in half an hour. This process can take hours. Our mission is to improve patient intake times and optimize operational efficiency. We are Zaris, a matching algorithm, a notification system, and a managerial dashboard. Currently, every new patient is assigned to the internal department in a rolling order, regardless of the department resources. For example, Marvin goes is assigned to wing A, Jacob is assigned to wing B, and etc. If the wing is at full capacity, it can take up to 24 hours to admit the patient in different wing. That causes a lot of delays. Our vision is to create a matching system that will match patients with apartments based on wings availability and patients' needs to drastically reduce wait time and optimize patient transfers. In this case, since A is full, Marvin is initially directed to internal C, and Jerome, who needs a ventilator, will be directed to a wing with a ventilator available. Our algorithm takes into consideration real-time metrics for optimal matching, such as bed vacancy, patient urgency, and the amount of med medical stuff available. For example, in internal E wing, the nurse will get a notification about an upcoming patient. The nurse receives full transparency about how and why the decision has been made and can accept or request a delay. Meanwhile, in the EV ward, the EV receives confirmation of transfer and ETA. At the same time, the patients are informed during the whole process by receiving an SMS and the ETA updates. 
Zaris can integrate within Root to show patients real-time tracking. Zaris will also provide transparency and real-time insights for managers. Our dashboard will show key performance metrics for each wing and allow the optimal oversight. This monitoring will allow managers to identify red flags and act upon them to improve patient's care. This is the currently time flow patients go through in the ED. And with Zaris, we're aiming to reduce the 2 hours and 10 minutes waiting time to 30 minutes. Zaris has many benefits for patients, medical staff, and hospital management, such as shorter waiting time, increase in patient satisfaction, more transparency, and most importantly, a shift of focus back to the patients. There are many financial opportunities when it comes to reducing the waiting time in the emergency department. Improvement in patient experience and operational efficiency can lead to increase in profit margins and an increase in revenue. The market size is enormous, with over 165,000 hospitals worldwide, 7,000 in the U.S. and 45 in Israel. Our goal is to start system integration in Q2 of 21, along with building the algorithm and doing all of the data scraping. We plan on rolling out the beta in Q4 of 21 with an official release of V1 in January of 22. Why choose us? We have a well-rounded and diverse team with background in design, data science, engineering, and business. We can make the ED Zaris. Thank you. Sorry, I was off. I said, Ariel, you go first. I saw your hand. Well, again, the, this was a very interesting uh, idea and a very well uh, put presentation. Two uh, quick questions. First, you mentioned justice. How do you measure or quantify justice? And second, uh, could you uh, elaborate uh, or mention which matching algorithm uh, you're employing? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you for the question. So regarding the first question, regarding the justice system, um, basically, we understood that in Ichilov, there is a justice system already in place where each uh, internal wing just receives a patient based on a rolling order of ABC. Um, and our position, the way we plan on positioning ourselves is a way that we can customize our algorithm for each hospital and their own justice system. So we would start off with the justice system as a default, but rely on real-time metrics to be flexible enough to change the patient's routing and matching accordingly. And regarding your second question, if you could please just repeat. Yes, uh, which matching algorithm are you employing? Right, so, so the matching algorithm is not something that we have yet developed, obviously. We, we plan on using real-time data um, and mapping out all of the resources that the hospital has in order to understand where best to put the patient. And, the, and, and again, our proposition is to really become a custom integration system for hospitals. So we would work on each hospital on a custom basis to develop their algorithm based on the needs that they have at their hospital. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. Anyone else? I will just comment that I really like the en route cameo. That was nice. <laughs> you know what? Uh, it's uh, amazing. This is really uh, a product in need. And uh, your answer to the justice system is, uh, is correct because, you know, finding the right justice system is going to be very difficult. We are struggling with that. Whether you are looking at the, at the department with the high occupancy, whether you are looking for the department with the uh, uh, highest uh, admissions, this is really an issue for, for making the right decisions and it can be tailored for any hospital to decide what is their justice system. And you can change it because there will be gaming. And within the gaming, you can adjust the, the justice system. Uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's correct. I just wanted to add on, on, on those nice remarks that um, we, we, we can basically 
Um, basically, we, we understood that the justice system is a matter of procedure and procedure is something that can change over time. So the best way to make the decisions regarding that procedure and those protocols is to basically put a flashlight on the performance of the different departments and, and provide the managers and the decision makers with the best insight possible in order to make the best justice system possible. I would also like to add something here, which we found interesting. Um, I think we are not, at the end of the day, uh, our we are giving a recommendation or kind of the algorithm is giving a recommendation, but at the end of the, the day, the humans or kind of the, the department itself have the full power to accept or not the patient. So we wanna, we get, we're gonna give them full transparency of why we have chosen what we have chosen, kind of give you, giving a whole, a whole picture of how the other departments are doing. So if you saw in the mocaps, we're giving kind of a text of you have been chosen because of these, 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 these other reasons, kind of giving them a sense of that they are part of a big group um, and, and they are working together for the same reason, being them more likely to accept the patient if it's been recommended. Beautiful. Um, I do want to give Joachim uh, a chance now because <laughs> you're always at the end, Joachim. So ask the question and we'll, we'll take a moment. Um, I'll try to make it short. Uh, very nice presentation. and uh, Makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, I, I think a lot of things in hospitals are fragmented. And so how do you envisage to integrate information about uh, availability of staffs in different department machines and so because in the first place the reason probably I, I assume that the guy is calling from the ER uh, so many people is because this information is not is not there and in the first place so how do you foresee integrating everything together right that, that's a great question uh, Dor if you want to talk about, a little bit about integration Very yes uh, I, I can um, to be honest, you know, on the first on the first stage, we'll implement the algorithm and the system in external way. I mean, we'll just scrape the the data from the existing uh, system. On these days, there are few uh, few systems that are based on a browser, and that way we can scrape the data externally without getting an uh, API to those uh, systems. And uh, uh, that way, that way we can uh, achieve the, this data. And, uh, and on the bigger picture, the the data that we need, like number of ventilators in each department, or uh, anything else, are a constant. So we can, when we are configuring a system to a certain hospital, we can uh, we can insert those uh, data, and then. Uh, our, our algorithm will adapt to them. Great, thank you, Dor. I, again, guys, I have to apologize, but we are going to continue. So thank you so much, everybody. And let's look at the next project. Hi, everyone. We're Expedited Black. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll present Quicker, an online pre-check-in solution for the ER. Let's start with the current state. Patients enter the ER by foot or by ambulances. On average, there are more than 300 patients coming to Ichlov's ER per day. When arriving, the patient answers a COVID-19 questionnaire. And after that, he waits in the reception for the admission process. The average admission time takes around 20 minutes. If the patient speaks a different language, the waiting time is even longer. And if multiple ambulances and patients arrive at the same time, the bottleneck is even worse. According to data from 2020, the average total time in the ER is more than five hours. What if we'll automate the admission process? And this way, we can reduce waiting time, improve patient and staff satisfaction, and forecast patient load while lowering costs. This is why we present our solution. Quicker, an online pre-check-in platform for patients coming by foot or by ambulances. Let's see how it works. We'll start with patient view. This is Alice. She's 26 years old, French tourist, suffering from abdominal pain and decided to go to the ER. Before coming, she's using Quicker in order to pre-check in. She enters the hospital website. Just for the presentation, we'll show the English version. Quicker supports multiple languages. 
She starts by specifying her ID. She can choose between typing, uploading ID card, or using face recognition instead. According to identification method she chose, some of the fields are automatically populated. On the next screen, she needs to declare her symptoms. The information collected from patients through Quicker smart form is the same information that we manually collect in the reception today. Quicker just present a quicker and efficient and streamlined way to gather the same information. She's choosing abdominal pain for the past four days. And the next step is to choose a payment method. This can be either referral or a credit card. She's confirmed her check-in admission and ready to go. Her details are now transferred to the hospital systems so the ER will know that she is on the way. And also she receives a text message with the check-in information and further instructions. When arriving to the ER, she go to the check-in screen at the entrance. She needs to identify. She can type her ID details, pass an ID card or use face recognition. Alice is ready to enter the ER without waiting in admission. She stays about 20 minutes and her hospital experience is less crowded and more convenient. Let's now discuss how Quicker supports the doctors and medical staff before Alice and other patients actually physically arrive to the hospital. Jason is currently the ER chief physician. He takes a look at the dashboard that is updated with patient information from Quicker's online check-in to see the number of incoming patients and their healthcare needs. Dr. Jason notices that there are 10 patients in their 20s, including Alice, set to arrive at the ER with complaints related to abdominal pain. Based on the information presented in the dashboard, Dr. Jason is able to coordinate medical staff, resources, and equipment in advance and prepare the medical team to receive those 10 patients at the ER in one batch based on symptoms and age group and place them on a fast track. As a result of the advanced coordination and timely consultation with those 10 patients, Dr. Jason and his medical team are able to discharge nine patients, including Alice, from the ER within 20 minutes. As a result of the quicker patient processing, the hospital saves five hours per patient, leading to a total savings of 45 hours in patient care time. Now that we've walked through the potential applications of Quicker, let's discuss the impact that this platform has the potential to create. With Quicker's online pre-check-in system, we save 20 minutes per patient. This leads to a time savings of 35 hours in the reception. In doing so, the hospital is able to create a better patient experience. From the medical staff's point of view, having an advanced view of patients that are en route to the hospital allows doctors to better prepare themselves and their teams to provide care. Overall, Quicker's platform presents two time-saving opportunities. Number one, reducing patient wait time at the reception, and number two, by forecasting patient loads and enabling dynamic fast track for incoming patients. So now the opportunity. Given the level of experience that our team brings and the diversity and talent, we think that we can have an MVP solution ready within one year. We estimate that we will need $1.2 million in funding to build the platform, and we expect that the investment in Quicker, based on industry standards, will lead to an almost 18% cost reduction for the hospital, which amounts to about $10 million per year. In conclusion, our team is prepared to hit the ground running. We have a draft business plan and the required resources. We are confident that Quicker can deliver a platform that drastically streamlines and improves the entire ER admissions and intake process. On behalf of the entire Quicker team, thank you for taking the time to meet with us today. We are looking forward to your feedback and questions. Thank you. Any questions from the judges? Yes, Ariel. Well, Again, compliments for the presentation and for the idea. One question, what, what's the advantage of admitting all patients with the same symptoms, say abdominal pains in one batch? It seems that you will overload the same kind of doctors at the same time. I can take this question. So speaking with uh, the doctor that uh, was joining and mentoring us, uh, Dr. Yoav, um, apparently, there is like a fast track option in the hospital, which means that the ER can have specific doctors having uh, like one doctor for the batch. And this way, it's the same examination for the 10 patients instead of having like going back and forth um, in order to have each patient separately. So it's just a faster way to uh, treat everybody in the same time. Okay, yeah. thanks. And just to add to, to what Elmog said, um, Dr. Yuav also mentioned that um, essentially when you're looking at patients with the same symptoms in the same age group, um, you're able to essentially order similar tests and sort of review them together. And so from an operations standpoint, things move um, a lot more quickly in terms of patient processing. Thanks again. Thank you. Greg. Um, you might have hit this, but I missed it. Uh, what, what's the competition or 
who, who are you going up against in this space? Any, anybody else? Yeah, so we, we have a slide. I, I think um, you all have our uh, deck in front of you. In, our, in the appendix, we have um, a slide that essentially presents a competitive landscape breakdown. And we recognize that there are a lot of um, sort of companies in this space, including a lot of startups, and then also larger EHR systems that, that sort of um, offer this uh, capability. But we think that no one has done a really good job of consolidating some of the features that we're presenting in our product. And so we're hoping um, that that is essentially what differentiates us from what exists currently. And also what? none of them are in Israel and can't like transfer easily to Hebrew, which is the language of the hospital systems. Good point. So what's, what, what do you think is the sort of critical one or two elements that, that are missing from the others? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think when we did sort of research of the, the competitive landscape, we noticed that um, the, the, the products that currently exist on the market either have this like self-service pre-check-in sort of um, feature, and then they have this like, you, you're able to like, provide um, information about your insurance and things like that. But a lot of the times they were missing things related to um, patient load, sort of allowing the hospital to, to predict that. And then also um, coming back to Omog's point, we noticed that there um, wasn't always the best product market fit. And we we're hoping to um, sort of achieve that with our product. Great, thank you. Um, Guy? Hi, uh, so uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, first question, why the paywall? Um, it shows, looks like, a sh like a more friction for the user. Second, why an app? I mean, people don't really get ready to get hospitalized. Uh, I, I can answer the second question first um, about the app. It's actually a, tw it's a website. We're debating between the two and then decided that people want, want to uh, download an application. And this is why using a website that everybody can just enter without signing in, it's a better option. So essentially our product would be placed like on Ecolove's existing website. The patients would just be guided to the section of the website where they can conduct this, this check-in. And I'm sorry, um, can you repeat your first question? You have a paywall, uh, so people have to put their payments method when they go hospitalized, so it seems a bit odd. Basically, that's the system that now in the admission, uh, you need to have a referral or either put uh, your credit card, so it's the same information, but we wanted to do it in advance in the check-in process, uh, and this way all the uh, process about uh, the payment will be on the same time, like before you come. And we discussed with the financial department in the hospital, like that's the way that uh, they suggested us to do it. Usually it's more for a deposit. You put a deposit uh, when they are entering the emergency room. Yeah, I, I just think that if we want to incentivize people to use these kind of systems, we need to push back all the stuff that may make them want to do it only at the, the, the location. That's the point. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> more stuff to think about as we go forward with this. Uh, thank you, everybody. Hello. Let's talk about HealthKey unlocking all telehealth services with one app. In 2020, 72% of people in the US aged 85 or older, that's 13 million people, couldn't access their telehealth visit. Meet my grandma, Estelle. Since the COVID pandemic, she hasn't been able to see a doctor in person. The only way she could communicate with her doctor was through telehealth, but she doesn't know how to set it up. So she hasn't seen a doctor and she's not the only one. Telehealth has grown 8,000% since 2019 and has a projected market of a quarter of a trillion dollars. It's an amazing tool, but absolutely worthless if it can't be accessed. This rapid growth towards telehealth leaves behind the population that needs the healthcare the most, the elderly. Dr. Tenner, our mentor, shared with us his conversation. Conversations like this happen every day between doctors and patients and leads to patients being late or missing appointments. Technical difficulties like these
and cost healthcare providers billions of dollars. This slide demonstrates the current patient experience. On the right is a video walking through the number of steps you need to access your telehealth appointment. As you can see, it's not a simple process and it's not accessible to older patients. I mean, look at it, it's still going. Can you imagine your grandma doing this? This multi-step process that requires several usernames and passwords leaves people like our grandparents without access to care. The solution to all this wasted time and money? Health key. We believe telehealth should be simple. That's why our services are designed to fit into your and your grandparents' everyday life. Whether you are doing a routine checkup, a follow-up appointment, or changing your insurance, we're here to make it as easy as possible. HealthKey is a privacy as a service company that reduces the long cumbersome process you just saw into three easy steps. First, with HealthKey, you can create an account for yourself or for your grandma in seconds. To set HealthKey up for any patient, all you need is their name, their email, and their insurance provider information. Our advanced encryption makes it easy to securely talk to your doctor at any time without having to remember dozens of passwords or any security questions. By partnering directly with the providers, HealthKey handles patient verification and authentication through a proprietary seamless process unseen by the user. We will create a secure authentication process that links all of a patient's telehealth services. So by logging in with HealthKey, a patient is securely logged in to any of the telehealth services their provider utilizes. But all the patient sees is how easy starting their appointment is. The HealthKey product is designed for the elderly patients and it will benefit both patients and the doctors. So after the COVID, uh, the telemedicine market has increased to 76% in the US. And with this rapid growth, other companies in the space are experiencing growing pains. Telehealth companies are struggling to balance ease of use with privacy and securities. And the, the project loss due to the telehealth no-shows is 114 billion per year. Our product will increase the 5% of the appointment compliance and 20 appointments per day for, for doctors. Our product will increase uh, about uh, 53,000 per year for each doctor. The biggest complaint about telehealth is that it is difficult to access. And that's where we come in. We are not replacing any of the apps already in place. We are just unlocking their potential by helping people access the care they need. There are lots of healthcare focused apps, but our focus is on easy to use platform, cross platform functionality and state of the art authentication. We will take a year to build out our MVP. We will let security and ease of use be the two principles that drives our MVP. We will then pilot test a health key with Ichilob before expanding to a beta test with three providers, all of different sizes. Finally, we plan to launch in late 2022. Given a successful pilot and beta test, we expect health key to grow rapidly once launched. Since there are so many privacy considerations, the cost to build health keys MVP will be on the higher side, but will save us money in the long run. We also imagine the cost of onboarding a new provider to decrease as the health key grows and the cost needed for user acquisition to decrease as well. The more appointments a healthcare system has, the more revenue it will make using HealthKey, since we project to save providers 53K per year per physician. We will charge 5% of that realized revenue or roughly 2,500 per provider. Our team is greatly positioned to build and implement HealthKey. We have a variety of skills on the team, and many of us have formal backgrounds in health technology, computer science, and optimization. We also have a know-how in the business, marketing, and growth aspects of HealthKey. And this is HealthKey, unlocking all your tech health services with one app. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, Ariel, see your hand. Well, this seems like a very a, a, a interesting and potentially useful uh, idea. But I, one thing that I wonder, you say that you reduce the number of steps uh, from the user uh, part from about 12 or more to something like three while keeping all the good features of existing applications in particular with respect to secure authentication, privacy, et cetera. So, Where's the kind of the magic? What's the uh, 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 the uh, magic point uh, in uh, your idea? 
yeah, I can speak to this. So um, right now there's no real good way to standardize the authentication for users when using these services. So at each step, there's a login wall with a unique username and passcode for that platform. We kind of modeled our idea off of an app used frequently in the US called Nextdoor. It's an app that kind of creates um, communities on their app based on where you live. So you end up in a chat room with your neighbors. And they were able to create a process that authenticates someone's address based on their phone number, even if they've moved and their area code is different than their current address. So we plan to kind of do the same thing where we use the insurance provider number as the link across all these platforms, since every single one of these platforms has that insurance provider number. And we'll have to work closely with insurance providers as well as healthcare providers and governmental regulations in order to safely and securely use that one key, so to speak, to unlock all of the logins for all of the other services. So by our login, if we can verify the users is using the correct insurance provider information, then we can essentially allow them to log into anything without having, from that point on, we'll essentially be a password manager for their other accounts and allow them to log in. So once they log in securely to us and we verify them and we take on that kind of burden, they'll be able to access anything downstream. I hope that helped clear it up a little yes, bit. Yes, certainly, thank you. Thank you. Um, Joachim, let me take you first this time. Oh, what an honor, thank you. Thank you guys for the nice presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, what's the number of different health services that uh, a person is using? Meaning in Israel, you know, someone in Klalit would may, may just uh, install the Klalit app and so, same for Maccabi or another uh, insurance company and work from their app. What, how, so how many different health provider uh, does an average human mm -hmm. use? Absolutely. I killed this one. So focusing on the elderly populations, they often talk to multiple different providers for multiple different ailments. Um, and that averages sometimes at seven, depending, it continues to increase, but from around 65 or over, it's generally seven or more. And then if you can just think, well, this could be expanded as it will, like the accessibility of it would make it easy, even for people who are younger, um, if you just count your regular doctor's appointment and then maybe you might have a physical therapist or psychiatrist, that already just for an average for like a person my age might just already be three. And those three have different service logins and as you see, have cumbersome ways of being able to access. And not always, and you must include like the random times that you might want to be able to see a doctor, like just offset or like a one-off time. So it's certainly neat. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so a uh, quick question about fraud. Uh, I mean, uh, have you given thought to the, you know, the challenges around, around that? Definitely. Um, that's kind of the main reason why we said it'll take about a year to build out our MVP. Technically, we don't think this will take a year to build out, but we think making sure security is top of mind and we're at for, as fraud proof, proof as possible. That's where a lot of our time will go. You know, there's always a chance of fraud with these things. Our goal is to take that layer um, of security off of the individual services. Um, so they don't, so we will have a, you know, unique fraud uh, detection process that is based off of machine learning models as to when people log in, how they log in, kind of as credit cards do for your purchasing history. Um, and we'll just get better with that over ease. And I think our pilot with Ihilov would teach us so much about that. And that's why after that one pilot, we want to do a beta test with three other providers because with each provider will come unique opportunities for fraud that we can tackle before we launch publicly. Beautiful, thank you. Um, okay, we're also at the end of our five minute session. So let's move on to the next project. Hi, I'm Jean from Green Planet Orange team. Let's introduce you to Carol. Carol is 75 and lives alone. She has a few serious medical ailments, diabetes, tremors, and hearing impairments. She takes many medications and frequently visit doctors. Since the start of COVID-19, Carol has been unwilling to leave her house to buy pills or visit doctors. 
this isolation has led to beginning symptoms of depression and cognitive loss. Sometimes she's even forgotten to take pills. Carol wants to be able to care for herself, to stay independent and take her pills on her own. But close family and doctors need to make sure she's actually caring for herself from afar. Carol can be any of our grandmothers. The elderly community is booming and a good portion of this population will have some chronic illness. In the US only, there are at least 37 million of the older adults have at least one chronic disease. Older adults suffer from chronic diseases and an increase in isolation, which leads to behavioral well-being problems. How can we help them comply with their treatments and increase their well-beings? Let us introduce you to Minder. Minder is a smart device that helps older adults continue their treatment at home while remotely monitoring their well-being for close family and caregivers. Minder connects between older adults, family members, and doctors. Let's return to Carol. Minder has fit well into Carol's kitchen, and she's begun using it in her daily routine. Each day, Carol receives a personalized reminder to take her pills, and Minder's simple, textured, big button easily dispenses Carol's pills. After taking her pills, Carol then answers behavioral well-being questions her doctor has specifically requested for her. When Carol does not answer these well-being updates, notifications are sent to family members. Family members can also request to receive a timely update on Carol's status. Dr. Eddie can open his login and see all his patients. Dr. Eddie can then monitor specific patient's medication compliance and well being within many specific parameters and dates. For example, Dr. Eddie chose to see John's mood during December. Here, Dr. Eddie wants to see how a change in medication affected John's sleep. These are the main competitors that exist today, but, but there is no company creating a smart, personalized device that monitors both medication compliance and behavioral well-being. Now, market sizing. The United States spent $2.1 trillion on elderly health care, 56% of total cost. HMO spent $100 billion on non-adherence, and the admissions of all the others per year is 12.9 million. Our device can reduce these costs by lowering non-adherence and decreasing admissions. Minder is beneficial for HMOs due to cost reduction and early intervention. Healthcare facilities also gain value from the data-driven real-time healthcare as well as continuity of care. We expect to have an MVP in partnership with HMOs by six months, and after a year, our final product. In a year and a half, we'll start marketing and penetration, as well as targeting future populations, such as the younger population with chronic illnesses and psychiatric patients. Thank you. We'd like to introduce our team, Avital, Tomo, Jean, William. We'd like to thank Dr. Garber and Dr. Tene, our designers, Netta, Hannah, and Ronnie, and our consultants, Daniel and Moran. Questions? Exactly. Guy, I see your hand. Hi, thank you. Uh, beautiful uh, presentation, uh, product design, so forth. Well done. Um, just some technical questions um, regarding cost and prices for development. Can you share a little inf information about that, please? Oh, okay, I can take that. So uh, we are thinking about uh, $100 cost per product, and uh, uh, we also think about uh, $50,000 for software development. So I think we're going to take uh, $150,000 for initial investment. I mean, uh, for the actual cost of the product and the cost for the consumer or the way that we, it will be actually delivered. Um, I'll take this one. The idea is to do like a subscription where it's like a monthly cost. Um, that way it's also not such a, cause this 
you can see so much in the video, but it in includes like the refills each um, each month of the because because we were taught here specifically we're dealing with the elderly community. We are looking to um, we would like to reduce the uh, the the background that they have to do. Like we would like to make it easy by also giving them their medication each month. Therefore, it would be subscription based as well as we would also like it to keep the uh, keep the patients with the hospital, like we said, continuous continuity of care um, so they can stay with the hospital as well as we're targeting, you know, Ichilov home now, which is um, remote monitoring for home hospitalization. And therefore you don't want to buy the whole um, device. You just want to take it for a certain amount of time. Thank you. Great. Um, Joachim? Yep, thanks guys for the very nice presentation. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, uh, would this save time to Dr. Hedy? Because Dr. Hedy, uh, the clinician in general, uh, have very little time. And so looking at patient data that might be coming you know, every day. So would there be a benefit in saving prospective time, say, to, to doctors? Oh. Um, the idea was to that it's continuous data, but the doctor can select the range of data he wants to see, meaning he doesn't have to see everything coming in. Um, he chooses what's important to him. And even in his dashboard, he can then filter. You know, if he suddenly sees the mood in a specific time is down, so he can see the different medications that were changed over that time or maybe the week before, or he can maybe after ask the patient in that specific time what happened. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Okay, I mean, again, you guys did a good job in presenting this. Do you have an additional thought? We have a minute or so left. Uh, I'm just gonna add in case it wasn't clear, the idea is to make this a personalized device, meaning on all three user ends, it can be personalized. On the older adult, they can change the settings. They can ask, you know, request how they want the reminders done. Um, like we said, on the family end, they can also request, you know, if how often they want to get the reminders, how involved they want to be. And the doctor actually um, he picks which questions are asked specifically to each uh, to each patient. Therefore, if it, you know specific disorders or diseases or different states, he can actually personalize this device to the specific patient, um, which is why we also think that the future market won't necessarily be the older adult market, but we can actually go into chronic diseases, psychiatric patients, like we said, home care, or even post-op. Great. Okay. Yeah, I can, I can also add to that. As Avita just mentioned, the personalization part is our value because in the market, we search for a lot of competitors. They just um, they did a good job in the physical part, but our value is more on the, the niche part. It's the mental health of the, um, of the elderly people during the pandemic. And we hope to have this um, product to um, outlive the pandemic. And also it can um, like provide more um, mental mental health um, facilitations for um, the patients after the pandemic. So we have a personalized like voice from family members and from the doctors to make them feel better when they are during isolation. Got it. Beautiful. Perfect timing. Thanks so much, guys. The main problem in the inpatient world is a lack of communication, which leads to frustration for both patients and the medical staff. The medical staff feels overloaded by patient requests, while the patients and their families are having trouble understanding the situation, which leaves them feeling clueless, uncertain, and anxious. Take Sarah, for example. She was admitted to the neurology department three days ago. She does not know it yet, but she will struggle with a number of communication-related issues throughout her 12-day hospitalization. She does not know what tests will be done on her. She cannot remember everything the doctor said. Her son is just as confused, and no one responds to the nurse button when she needed help. From her example, we demonstrated three main pain points. The first one, 
is the doctor's availability. Since the round times are inexact and they cannot leave a message, family members have to wait till the morning rounds to speak with the doctor. And this made the patient and their family feeling left out of the treatment plan. Also, the problem with uncertainty. Patients are often unsure about what important events have happened in the past day. They do not know what to expect next and seldom know the milestones that will lead to their discharge. Finally, the nurse call button, which has remained largely unchanged for the past 40 years. Nurse call buttons don't provide any context to the medical teams. In return, patients have learned that they must shout to get urgent help or abuse the button use. In summary, the problem can be broken down into three areas. Uncertainty regarding what the patient's journey will be like. And the communication needs to be improved as patients typically only have the opportunities to talk with staff during the doctor rounds. And the nurse calls need more context of the patient's need. And this problem is just not, not just an ICULOV, it's widespread at hospitals worldwide. Research shows that only about 30% of what the doctor says is being processed and understood by the patient due to information and emotion overload. And the solution is Inwards. Inwards is a secure mobile platform that allows patients and their family to get updates on the patient's current condition, communicate with medical care teams, and send context-rich call button requests, which helps patients reach out to their teams and it creates asynchronous communication between the staff and the patients since messages can be left and notes can be saved from daily rounds. Staff can check in on a tablet to update statuses by using a lookup table or by scanning their RFID badge in order to authenticate themselves. Then they can create daily updates in the status tab. Notes can be typed or recorded with recorded messages being tra transcribed into text automatically. This means anytime a family member comes in, they can catch up on the latest updates or if the patient chooses to, they can sign up their family members to receive text status updates so they're in the loop even outside of the hospital. The application also incorporates smart call buttons to replace the outdated nurse call button that provide no context into the needs of the patient. Patients can also write down notes or questions and then by using a slider, they can indicate the severity of their need. There's another device that can be placed in a doctor's office so that they can review and update the latest statuses if they choose to do so remotely. And by placing an iPad at a nursing station, we can provide a central location for messages to be seen in descending order based on urgency. And then messages can be marked as seen or resolved. And after a message is resolved, it will be swiped off of the list. Ultimately, Inwards works to reduce uncertainty and improve communication by creating better tools for medical teams to interact with their patients in contextually rich ways. Meaning Sarah's issues don't have to be issues anymore. Now, on to the business plan and how we can make this work. We'll be using HIPAA compliance offers to host our application, store patient data, and handle SMS messaging. And we make sure patient data is protected. Users enroll during admission, and there are no tie-ins with other systems at the hospital. In Israel, 1.1 million patients are admitted to the hospital every year, and a large proportion of them are not satisfied. With Inwards, we aim to increase patient satisfaction and improve their mental well being by reducing stress and anxiety in the wards. And there is no doubt that higher patient satisfaction is directly associated with higher profitability. By increasing patient loyalty, public funding from higher patient ratings, and staff e efficiency, we can increase revenue. Our plan is to first pilot an Ikilov neurology department from January 2022 and expand to three other departments in Ikilov and in the United States in 2023. Thank you for listening. Beautiful. Okay, time for some questions. Anyone? Is someone at the uh, Echilov side?
I just wanted to, this is Ronnie, I just wanted to uh, understand whether we are meaning that the, uh, the communication between the patient and the staff is going to happen to the cellular phone of the patient or whether we are suggesting some kind of a tablet connected to the, to the bed um, some kind of uh, I'll, I'll take it yeah uh, there's a there's one tablet that is next to the bed during the doctor's run when we did observation over the last months we saw that uh, the doctor is doing around and this is the only time they give information to the patient regarding his condition the family isn't always there and the patient doesn't remember it throughout the day uh, by a uh, uh, we saw that only 30% of the information is really the patient remember afterwards. So the idea is that uh, an iPad that's next to the patient bed will uh, keep his patient status. It will be recorded uh, by the doctor during the doctor round. When they tell the patient their status, the family can get a text message regarding if the patient wants to. Uh, the idea is that uh, it doesn't require additional uh, EMR integration, since the EMR doesn't uh, always, the information isn't supposed to be exposed to the, to the patient, and uh, it doesn't require additional work from the team itself. Since we added this tablet next to the bed, we also said it can replace the nurse button and uh, give an option to, to write messages. And to go on to what Greg was mentioning for another team, um, this would alleviate the need for patients that have to bring their own devices. So in a case where a patient wouldn't own their own device, they can still take advantage of this sort of service. Can, can I ask though, um, so you made the assertion it wouldn't create more work for the team, but I worry, I worry it actually would um, in the sense of, you know, you, you have a conversation with a patient and now you need to also sort of update the, you know, the information here if you're not, if you're not pulling it automatically from something else. I think a lot of it comes down to just improving the process and in that way it's going to reduce the work rather than saying communicating the same things redundantly yep. once you communicate it once it can be stored and then uh, that can be referred to by the patient and their family members so that's that's the thought process is like maybe there's a little bit more work up front but you get some of it in the back end where you don't have to like repeat yourself or come back just to answer the similar questions um, and then with it having uh, like integrated nurse call buttons we're being able to like prioritize where the staff's attention needs to go. So again, rather than them going to like a nuisance alarm where somebody's just maybe like upset or like just has like a general question, you can uh, you can apply your attention to where it needs to go before those real urgent needs get worse. Right, um, your thing? Yep. Um... I have actually a, a question about the nurse button. Um, I'm intrigued uh, as if it is a perceived need from the nurses that this button should be changed to something or should evolve to something different. Did you get that kind of uh, feedback from nurses that there is a need that this be more um, complicated in a sense than the on-off button? Yeah, that's a little bit, that, that's, a, that's an issue that we found in our notes a lot is that this thing was either like going, like the buttons that, that are traditionally used in hospitals are just spammed. Um, so that they, there's a lot of abuse with this button because it's just going to say, hey, like I, like, I need help, I need help. Um, so talking to other um, medical staff members, it became an issue of like either this button's constantly going to be depressed or it's not gonna really like provide context in like what that need is. Um, so we wanted to just be able to provide more information up front to, so that nurses know what issues are going to be had in which rooms. So maybe like junior staff can handle like lower, um, lower rank concerns where like senior staff can work on issues that are gonna be more immediate. Um, again, with like just physical assistance or if that's like a, a medication issue, 
or maybe somebody's even fallen out of the bed, um, we can stack rank these questions as they come in so that the right person can go to that room wherever that, that issue is existing. Right. Okay, great. Thanks, Eddie. Yeah. Let's go on to the next project. Hello, we are addressing the Detect the Decline challenge and we are team MindShield. We are Gal, Shiwei, Alejandra, Prashant, and Lotum. So the main problem we're addressing in short is that diagnosing Alzheimer's is difficult. Patients often come in once a disease has progressed past the first stage because of insufficient education and tools. Second, doctors often have to make a determination heavily based on the stories they hear from patients without having a personalized baseline for that patient or for their context. Lastly, Alzheimer's patients sometimes have good days and sometimes have bad days, so any one test on a given day does not accurately reflect the patient's state. To give you a better sense for the problem we're tackling, we have the symptoms listed here for the four stages of Alzheimer's. It's not so important for you to read them all as it is for you to see how widely they can range. They range from slowed functioning to slurred speech to loss of balance to disturbed sleep as well as other activity specific impairments. Researchers believe that treatments to slow the progression of Alzheimer's and preserve brain function may be most effective at the MCI or preclinical phase. So it's very important to detect AD as early as possible as such, this phase is our focus for this challenge. We propose a smartphone app that uses passive smartphone and wearables data in order to detect changes in cognitive function. This data includes facial expressions, eye movement, vital signs, and speech. We found through research that there is a connection between facial expression changes and Alzheimer's disease. By capturing facial expressions, responses to specific events over time, we can build a facial expression profile for the user. One of the most common symptoms categories when diagnosing Alzheimer's disease is speech. With their consent, we can use speech data from phone calls in order to detect when there may be problematic symptoms being exhibited by the user. Another common symptom in Alzheimer's patients is change in reading properties. MindShield can be trained to detect changes in eye movement in order to help flag a possible issue. Vital signs are essential in understanding how human body functions over time. With MindShield, we not only keep track on vital signs such as respiratory rate and heart rate, but also monitor users' activity and sleep patterns to detect and flag any deviation from normal before it's too late. Once installed, a user will not even notice mentioned at work, but it actually creates a baseline profile. The only instance under which a user would notice mentioned is if based on a model, change that reflect a cognitive decline occur and there's a reason for further assessment by physician. We are empowering users with their own data to know when it is the time to get checked out early. Hundreds of startups have been launched, but it is still in early days for digitally monitor cognitive declines. None of those companies have acquired a substantial customer base and there are great opportunities for newcomers in the market. So here are some examples of competitors. Darmian provides early detection through an AI-powered MRI image analysis technology, but it requires brain MRI scans that must be taken in clinics. Stick Hero Crest is a game developed to study the relationship between dementia and spatial navigation capabilities, but the application is to collect data and cannot make any prediction yet. NeuroTrack provides convenient and remote cognitive testing on web and mobile. Users take assessment regularly over time to monitor cognitive health and detect any change. But it is not a passive monitoring system, so it requires time and regular use to properly show patterns and deviations. Evidation is similar to our solution that it captures to analyze passive, continuous behavior data. However, it is mostly served as a research platform to conduct studies, and it is not ready for commercial use cases by individual users yet. In addition, the test streams collected by Evidation is different from our solution. Next, please. 
$305 billion was spent worldwide on providing healthcare to Alzheimer's disease patients, up over 10% from $244 billion in the last year. Through research, we learned that early diagnosis would decrease the per person cost by about 15%. This translates to $46 billion in potential savings. We will build MindShield as a subscription-based direct-to-consumer app. Assuming we get just 10% adoption among our target demographic in Israel and the US, we forecast annual revenue of $60 million if we, get, if we charge just $10 per user per month for MindShield. Our product roadmap is simple. In the initial phase, we focus on conducting user studies and collecting user data. Once our hypotheses are validated and enough data is gathered, we move to model building phase. Finally, we deploy the model in our user-friendly MindShield mobile application and launch the app in the market for beta testing and gathering user feedback for future iterations. We know we are the right team to solve this problem, not only because we have strong business design and technical experience, but also because we are passionate about reducing the impact of neurodegenerative disorders in humans for optimal functioning of the society. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions for this team? Yes, Greg. Uh, nice presentation, guys. Um, one question is, how do you get the facial imagery or, you know, or, or, or what are you planning to piggyback on to, to, get, to get the imagery? Like, or, or how are you enticing your users to actually give you, give you the images that you need for the facial recognition? Like, the, you know, like a game or some, some other interaction? We want to get a facial uh, expression when they are taking phone calls with their close relation people. So for example, uh, the parent we want to give her image, image, facial image when he or she is making a phone call to his son. So we hope to, that's what we are going to capture. Yeah, Guy. What, what does the, the MVP include? I mean, assuming that you still don't have these data that you know, even if you have access to the facial expressions and so forth, you still don't have the big data to, in order to indicate that something is happening. So what do you suggest as an MVP? Um, we base on research in the field and we track anomalies. We have uh, enough uh, facial uh, photos from a long time. So we build like a face profile and then we search for anomalies in this profile that match to older uh, research in the field. Yeah, Joachim. Uh, thanks, uh, guys. Um, I think the need is at least seems clear to me, but um, I've, I've seen in terms of the applications, I've seen a lot of papers uh, looking at speech, face, and so on to try to quantify <coughs> the decline in this camp of uh, mental um, diseases. The question is, did you find any company that actually developed something out of it, meaning something really applied? I think the most similar, uh, one of the most similar one is evidation, which is included in our slides. So they are doing uh, monitoring and they are, they are keeping track of a lot of signals from different sensors. But currently, uh, it is still more research focused. So they have been studies using their system to, to, uh, to analyze hundreds of people and how they are, they are going to had the likelihood of dementia, but it's not used in commercial yet. So I think they are still trying out how to make it to be commercialized. Yeah. But I think most studies, they are still in the research progress and not make into an application in real life. Seems right. Thank you. Thank you all. Is there any other question? Time left. Okay, do you guys want to add something to your presentation as we have a, a minute or so left? No?
No? Okay. Well, that's good. And we end a little, uh, a little earlier on this one. So thank you all. And um, yeah, let's fast forward to the next presentation. Hello everyone, we are Green Hospital. Our mentor is Dr. Rovid Geva, and let's make sustainability accessible. So in Saraski Medical Center, 60% of served food is thrown away. Here you can see a plate that you maybe think it's, is going to be served to the patient, but actually is after he already been eaten. This all the food is going to be thrown away. Also all this. That's $3.6 million a year on, on food wasted in Ifilo. And why? So first of all, the inability to choose as staff members and as patients. You can choose what you get to eat, what items you get and don't get. And incompatible portions. You could be a one kilo, 100 kilogram guy and you could be a 50 kilogram older lady and you will get the same portion. So our solution to that is plate it. With plate it, patients, staff and hospitals come together to eat smarter. So that's the screen that the customers would see when they enter the app. Here, the patients would fill in their allergies, the conditions that they might have and food preferences. Based on that, we would offer them food that exists in the kitchen these days. You can see in the upper part of the screen, the schedule, the patient's schedule. If they have tests on Sunday, let's say a colonoscopy, we would not offer them food that is not compatible for that test. And you can see breakfast and lunch, and we only offer things that are compatible for the patient. So to personalize the meal for the staff or the patient, that's how it works. So we've got two systems of the hospital, the SCP known as the Mer and Chameleon. That's where we take medical info about the patients. We've got the patient that put in information like we showed before and the staff that has to type in what they would wanna eat according to what they prefer. And we've got the database. The database would save information about patients. It would remember what they asked for last time. And of course, for staff who eats every day in the hospital, and at the right end of the screen, you can see the kitchen. The kitchen on the one hand would offer plated food that is in hospital, in the hospital these days. On the other hand, at the end of the process, plated would send the kitchen, the preferences and the food that has to be made. So to really maximal, maximize, maximize the personalization of the plate, we would wanna ask the customers how was the food? Did they eat everything? Too little? Enough? Too much? What items did they did not get? If they didn't eat the yogurt two days in a row, we would offer a banana. So in terms of value added, uh, apart from the obvious reductions in cost uh, based off of saving on food waste and uh, the better public image uh, for the sustainability efforts, we're really excited to show the patients at the center of the plated experience. Uh, so we think it's going to really improve patient morale to have them be part of the process uh, in terms of their care and their meals uh, and really give them something to do in like long, boring hospital days. Uh, from the market side, we hope to align hospitals incentives to where uh, saving money and saving and sustainability and reducing CO2 emissions are aligned. So in the U.S., uh, the total addressable market will be 500 million or so uh, annually, and that's equivalent to 150,000 tons of CO2. We're differentiated from our competition on a few main points. Uh, the first being that we address serve food waste. Uh, so disposal technology or repurposing like composting really only looks at food scraps uh, in the kitchen. And we're looking at things that are served on plates and then thrown away uh, and reducing it on that end. The other side is uh, that we integrate with current hospital procedures in terms of the kitchen and uh, food service and their ordering ticket technology, making it a really easy implementation into hospitals. As far as development goes, we hope to pilot in the Ikilov Oncology Center where we can uh, start field testing and really get to know our patients and doctors and what they might want 
and then optimize the algorithm so we can personalize their meals as much as possible while also like optimizing for the efficiency of the kitchen itself. So we really want this to be part of the green hospital revolution and expand beyond uh, food uh, conservation as well. So we hope to expand to things like energy conservation and patient involvement, uh, water, and uh, really become a whole green hospital uh, process here. So thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you guys. All right, questions, Greg. Cool, cool idea. Um, I, I wonder if you thought about capturing an image of the plate after, after uh, you know, it's being turned in like when they pick it up um, so that you could automatically, you know, extract the information about what they didn't eat or what's left over. Yeah, I can speak about that. We actually, we did discuss it. Uh, I think it's something that uh, from a tech standpoint, uh, we'd obviously love to develop, but uh, in the short term, we're really more focused on uh, piloting with a small group of patients uh, in an area where we can focus on figuring out what our consumers really want, uh, like being able to center the whole experience around the patients and being able to hack our uh, app as much as we can to get that as quick as we can. Uh, so that's definitely something we consider down the road, uh, but not something that we're focused on uh, immediately. Joachim? Thanks guys, very nice idea. Um, didn't think about that um, in the hospital um, context. Uh, two short questions. The first is how much time in advance of the food cooked? Uh, because we probably kitchens are cooking for hundreds of people and versus how long in advance do patients need to order using your, your system? And the second question um, is, do, uh, is the food, food waste due to the fact that people don't like the specific food they are served or, or is it because they're just not hungry but food needs to be served anyway? because in, people need to eat eventually or should eat, say. So you're going to serve it anyway because you need to push patient to eat. Uh, so I could take that question. Um, about the time that has to be, that the kitchen can make the food. Um, they can make the food and keep it uh, in the refrigerator for three days, from what we discussed uh, with the kitchen employees. Uh, if it's warm food, you can keep it until one day. Um, about the hours, these days they have to ask the kitchen three to four hours before, and we want to limit that time to two hours. Um, and the other question was about, uh, remind me please. I, I can jump in and speak to the second part. Uh, I, I think, uh, like we said earlier, there's, uh, from the research we did, it is like inability to choose, people not liking the food or the incorrect quantities of food uh, adding to most of the waste. So uh, we're, while we're estimating like 40 to 60% of food that's been served to patients is wasted, we don't think we're gonna be able to eliminate all of that, but we think there's some like low hanging fruit uh, in terms of reducing waste. So it's things like if someone's getting way too much quantity, uh, they can address that or if someone knows they're not gonna eat yogurt that they're given every day for breakfast for the seven days they've been in the hospital, they can say, I don't want that, they won't get it anymore. And then they can be offered something uh, in place of that. So it's, it's reducing uh, that amount, we're time targeting like uh, reducing 50 to 60% of the current waste uh, to make an impact that way. Great, thank you. And Guy, you wanna ask a question at the end? Yes, please. Uh... Beautiful uh, presentation. I like the colors and everything. Did you guys uh, get a chance to show this idea to the hospital chef and get uh, his or her reaction? Um, actually, yeah, we visited in the hospital's kitchen two days ago. And uh, the funny thing is that the main chef, the head chef of the hospital said, he said, I know the the food is not great and I would do everything I can to make it better. And that's the, the idea that we had to do the change hand by hand with the hospital and make a two direction system, not just one direction to give the food. We want to ask the patient if they like it or not. And the kitchen is totally with us. 
Yeah, like another long term uh, goal there would be to aggregate a lot of this data that we're getting uh, in terms of feedback and patient preferences and then be able to use that uh, and literally deliver that to the kitchen so they can order better, they can create menus better. Uh, it's not completely saying every plate has to be 100% personalized. It's allowing them to be more efficient and have a better end product uh, through data in the long term as well. And a big thank you to Anna, our designer, uh, for making it all look wonderful. That's all on her. Thanks, guys. I second that. Great. Okay, thank you so much. Perfect in time. So let's go to the next project. Hi, I'm Maya. How can I help you today? Meet Maya. Maya is your friendly AI nurse who will guide you through your journey as a NICU parent. Having a baby in the NICU is a traumatizing time for parents. They are feeling grief and loss, realizing that they can't go home with their new baby. Anxiety, fear, and confusion are compounded by the often harsh and hostile environment, and parents feel scared and guilty for not being there with their babies. Although they are trying, doctors can't be available all day long to answer parents' questions, leaving them desperate for information. Ikilov addresses this by holding daily meetings for parents, but with interviews with parents, this information under the fragile situation is difficult to process and to remember. Parents need to know where they are physically in the medical process and emotionally. They need to be supported, to be heard, and to understand what is happening and to be involved. Medical staff, however, are lacking the resources to provide this crucial information to parents. Maya is a humanized, intelligent, AI-powered personal assistant who will guide you through your baby's hospitalization. She is integrated with EMR and uses a sensitive approach to provide parents with all the information they need to know. Through Maya's homepage, you can get to know the doctors on board and even directly chat with the Ikilov social team. They're all very friendly. Maya will provide photos of your growing baby and to help you celebrate every milestone he reaches and also provide an option to share with your family and friends. Maya will intuitively show you everything you need to know even before you ask and is available to answer any questions. As simple as, where can I get the best coffee to the most complex medical questions? Maya will not hesitate to call a doctor if needed. She is there to help you navigate this new world, both physically and emotionally. Maya is unique because it combines two of the best features of separate apps, secure messaging and EMR integration, and adds this additional AI interface. Other apps have individual features, but no app has all three in combination, and no app has yet to use an AI personal assistant. We aim to be an experienced leader by delivering the most relevant information in the most supportive way using the best tools. By providing an excellent experience for NICU parents, Maya is a valuable marketing tool for hospitals. It could lead to improved patient satisfaction scores, increase the NICU's ranking, and increase word of mouth referrals. Moreover, by providing education to parents, Maya can better prepare them for at-home baby care and can reduce readmissions. If the Maya application leads to even one more additional NICU patient, that translates to an average of $14,000 USD in additional revenue and $2,100 in additional profit at Ikilov. Our primary revenue stream hospitals can provide $9.6 million in revenue per year with just 10% of the market. Additionally, we hope to advertise to the $10 billion at home baby product market. We can begin prototyping our product immediately at Ikilov and conduct user tests there to improve patient satisfaction. We can start a US pilot in March of 2022. Eventually, we hope to expand Maya's use to serve parents during normal pregnancies, which can open up another huge market. While $40 billion is spent in the NICU, upwards of $100 billion is spent in the overall pregnancy and delivery market. We believe that this is the best team to execute our product roadmap 
Given that we come from key backgrounds relevant to the development and success of our application, such as medicine, AI, software engineering, biomedical engineering, design, health policy, and business. We are also grateful for our mentors and Ikilog who provide us with guidance throughout this process. Thank you very much for your time. Ariel, I see your hand. Yes, uh, thank you. That uh, uh, seems like a very good idea. Um, but now you say that you rely on some AI technology. Uh, is it uh, a technology that already exists on the shelf or is it something that would need to be uh, produced and developed for uh, your product? I'll take this question. Uh, now I'm a technology and medicine. Uh, we are an AI team. Most of our team are AI researchers and we plan to develop the technology. And you have a, a, a feeling or a, that uh, you, you will be able to succeed in developing the right uh, technology for this product because it's quite challenging you know, to yeah, so what's great is that this type of technology using AI already exists, actually, but it's not been applied to the specific um, like NICU field, which is why we think that it would be great for this particular problem. Okay, thanks. Great. Um, anyone else? Can, can you just elaborate on that last uh, comment uh, about uh, where, where has it been applied before? And I spe specifically around the emotional aspect of it, which I think is really compelling. If you can crack that, then, you know, I think that's really vital in this context. Yeah, so essentially it is a, at the end of the day, it's like an AI chatbot and it's been used in many different fields, such as, and one of those fields is mental health. And some examples can be like Wobot, which is also a very empathetic AI uh, chatbot that you can connect with. And this is kind of similar in that sense where it'll deliver all the relevant information that, that you would need, but also in a very supportive way that is appealing to the parents who are undergoing this type of traumatic experience. Great. Um, Guy, I saw your hand at some point. Was your question yeah. in? Well, I'm wondering why, why do we need AI for this thing? I mean, and who should feed the, the information which is not uh, uh, just content-based or experience-based? Um, the, information no is, yeah, the information is taken from the EMRs. It, uh, you need MI for simplification and, 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 and to have it represented in a way that is understandable and by the parents. And you need an eye for the interaction to be for the personalization, to make the information specific, understandable, and simple. Yeah, so a lot of parents, when we conducted our user research, um, they mentioned how they have a lot of information or they connect with the medical staff, but they aren't really able to understand what's going on, especially because medical terminology can be very difficult to understand. Um, like, what is a like oxygen saturation level of say like, I don't know, 80% supposed to mean to them. So then basically Maya is supposed to be a tool that takes all this AMR data and basically filters it and communicates it in a way where like anyone can understand. Okay, any, any other question or thoughts, judges? Um, well, if we have a minute left, guys, you want to add something to clarify or further enhance? To add something. So in addition to the AI, there's also, uh, Rui mentioned the EMR integration. That's another big feature of this. And then the, the third feature is the ability to send messages or send messages between clinical staff and the parents, and in particular, uh, images of the, of the baby in the NICU. Understood. Okay, well, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, 
just to like clarify at the end, um, basically when we spoke to parents, just some of the key problems they're facing is just they want the relevant information. So this is the EMR homepage. They wanna have someone who will be empathetic to them and be supportive because it's a traumatic experience. So that's where like Maya comes in with the sensitive language. And at the end of the day, they also wanna connect with their baby. And that's where seeing the milestones and seeing the, the live, uh, like the photos also will help them to do that. So those are our three core features. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good day, good evening, and good night, everybody. I'm sure we all enjoyed the show. And to the students, I say, great work. Now, as this is a pre-recorded message, how can I commit in advance that this is indeed the case? Well, as the Jacobs program head at the Technium, I've been following your progress, and I have no doubt that the grand finale is as great as your progress all along. I think we can say that you are already entrepreneurs, creating and innovating despite of all the technical challenges and time schedule issues, in particular those posed by this year's circumstances. You should be proud of your work as well as of your path and the experience you gained. All these will help you for your next hackathons and your next academic and professional challenges. On behalf of the Jacobs, Cornell Tech, and Technion teams, this is an opportunity to express our thanks and gratitude to the doctors, nurses, and staff from the Swarovski Medical Center, also known as the Ichilov Hospital, as well as to our partners from MindState and all the designers that were on board. Indeed, this year we all had to deal with unusual circumstances. Yet I believe that this has been for us yet another opportunity to realize how through the innovations of technology, uh, in this case the internet, we can better cope with challenges, even with an extraordinary one such as a worldwide pandemic. At the same time, this experience was yet another opportunity to appreciate how invaluable direct physical human interactions are. While this was not possible through this year's eye track and ideation competition, we at the Technion look forward to a future opportunity to host in the Technion campus in Haifa each and all of the participants of this year's ITREC from North America, from China, from Europe, virtually from all around the globe. You experience a technological entrepreneurship project related to health and medical care. In general, technological entrepreneurship, if successful, has the promise to bring fame, honor, and also financial wealth. But entrepreneurship and innovation in the area of human health brings about yet another particularly unique satisfaction, that is, the ability to prolong and improve human life. The combination of these two dimensions of satisfaction was nicely summarized in a piece of text that was written here in Israel many, many years ago. I refer to a couple of, a couple of verses from the book of Proverbs. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who find understanding. Long life is in her right hand, in her left hand are riches and honor. I'm sure that through your experience with this year's ITREC and its related coursework and ideation competition, you had the opportunity to personally feel the message conveyed by these old verses. Finally, on behalf of my colleagues on the panel of referees, good luck to everyone. Good evening, everyone and welcome to the Technion Cornell Ideation Competition. I'm sure you're all excited to reach the final stages of the course. I presume it has been a challenging experience. You've seen a lot, learned a lot, exchanged ideas with your colleagues and accomplished things that you have not done before. It does not matter if you are the winner of that specific competition or not. One thing, I'm sure you'll be all taking home with you is the understanding that we are living in a very exciting era in human history. The combination of technology with multidisciplines, including medicine, engineering, computing, offers opportunities that we have not met before. Never in the course of history of mankind was the distance between an idea and its materialization been so short. Let me raise one exemplary thought. In the first chapter of the Bible, we learn that God has created the world with words. Considering the following idea, 
Today, I can dictate to my computer, as I'm doing right now, my ideas, and it turns them into typed letters. I therefore can dictate computer codes, which in turn can be combined into a complicated algorithm. This algorithm, again, in turn, through another set of processes can be potentially be linked to a 3D printer, such as those we have today available for printing living tissues and cells. It follows that with my words, I can actually print an artificial organ. Of course, the technology is currently not mature enough for daily implementation yet. Nonetheless, we can see the possibilities in the very near horizon. What I urge you to do tomorrow is to try to think beyond that horizon. Good luck, everybody, and see you in the exciting future. Thank you. Hi, everyone. First of all, we want to thank you all for your determination, passion, and hard work. First and foremost, Ronnie Gamzo, where are you, Ronnie? Your continued support and collaborative spirit has made this event really special, and we are ever more grateful for your generosity, friendship, and constant enthusiasm. Professor Eli Sprecher for his vision and enabling, Eyal Kellner, Mohamed Gara, Michael Trigger, Elad Rosenbaum, Aviv Shocher, and all of the Ichilov medical staff who provided mentorship, one-on-one -on -one support for the students, thank you. The sharing of valuable data, insights, and guidance was invaluable, and we are so appreciative of your trust and ownership in the students. And of course, Lilach Weitz and Omer Muzafi, for your hours of brainstorming and connecting all the dots in Ichilo. We also want to express gratitude to Greg Morissette, Ron Brachman, Fernando Gomez Vaquero, Michael Escozia, and Vasilis Drumalitis for our continued growing relationship and collaborations. We are, a, we are a, sorry, we are ever grateful to our academic partners in this program, Technion and Cornell Tech, for their support and for lending us your top-notch students. In particular, Oded Rabinovich, Ariel Orda, Joachim Bachar, Lucy Milanez, and Sophie Segel. None of this could have taken place without you. Wix, Google, SimilarWeb, Lightrix, Madlan, HiBob, Climacell, and more. You represent the greatest of Israeli innovation. It is an honor to work with all of you, and thank you, thank you, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to build with us. Only Sidner from Monday.com for letting us work with this fantastic platform, providing the tools for us all to connect, innovate, and create. Liat Pasak for, uh, from IMED for her generosity in providing this beautiful startup space. Guy Gamzo, you are phenomenal. Your innovation, expertise, friendship, personal mentorship is so meaningful to mind state. Thank you. Roy Weissner for working with us this year and guiding our students. It was so special for all of us to have someone from the health tech VC world inspire and infuse the program. To our former participants, Ishan Verk, Max Tehalanti, the Enru team, Lee Seti, and Ariel Halperin. To Tyler for putting this entire show together and to Michael and Lucy for helping us with every step of the way. We could have not done this without you. Lastly, our excellent judges, your observations and questions will help the students move forward in the future towards innovation and impact. Thank you. So now to our awards, the awards, this cash prize awards are made available by the Dr. Joseph Halt and Helen Maccabi Rose Fund. Thank you. So as the Nobel Prize laureate said, to have a good idea, you must first have a lot of ideas. And after you have the right idea, you must make the idea right. And the right ideas are, ah, let's hear. So the third prize, $2,000, we have Lilach Weitz to come and announce. So, Third prize goes to Libby. Yay. Okay. 
Now, just before we go to the second prize, I just want to say that this prize was in honor of a student of mine who passed, Eyal. We're very happy to continue um, in his memory with this project. The second prize for $3,000, we will have Roy Weissner, our judge, will now, one second. Yes. And the second prize goes to Minder. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and the first prize, we have Professor Ronnie Gamzo, who sat here the whole time, listened, and was very, very happy to see what, all these projects. Ronnie Gamzo. Hi, hi everybody. So before announcing the first prize, you will have to be patient and hear me speaking and saying a few words. Thank you for, for your wonderful, enthusiastic uh, project and the way that you are running it, Tamar. And this is, uh, uh, every year you are winning another, we are reaching another climax. And thank you very much for, for, for the way that you are managing it. And it's really a, a pleasure to see what's going on here. Uh, the collaboration between Cornell Tech, the Technion here in Ichilov, and all the, the designers and all the people that are involved in giving us the spirit to go ahead and to do more and more rethinking and innovations. And it's really a thrill to see what's going on here. Uh, I can thank, uh, you know, Corona time for uh, putting more challenges in front of us and keeping this kind of spirit, although we are in a corona time and although we are in a lot of restrictions, we are still going on and this is the way to go in my opinion. It was really uh, exciting to see the 12 groups, not only here in the presentation, I've explored uh, running between rooms here all around the week and see what, what what you are doing and the way that you are thinking and the way that you are trying to reinvent uh, how we are doing medicine and what we can do better and how we can do better and coming with solution, coming with ideas. Sometimes you coming with ideas that I'm saying to myself, how come I never thought about it? And this is a real thrill. And so I, I, I will say to all 12 groups, you are all winners, real winners, any one of you, and the way that you presented that, the design, the attractive design and the attractive ideas is really a win for any one of you. But then again, there is still a winner. <laughs> and the winner is Defi. Defi is the winner, and uh, I want to say that uh, we have uh, explored uh, coming in with, within um, the groups this week, and I saw the enthusiasm in the group of the Defi, and then the, your, your presentation here as well. So lots of luck, and uh, you really have a thing going, and uh, uh, lots of luck to what you are doing. But then again, so I'm so happy to say that this is not only DEFI because uh, uh, it's this year we in Ichilov will embrace another two teams to go forward and we try also to give uh, uh, honorably me uh, mention to, uh, to two teams, two projects. Uh, you know, in the Corona time, we uh, have a challenge to run better our emergency room. When you understood how the emergency room is, is, is really crucial to, to the way that we are running our hospital. And uh, indeed, we so I've uh, acknowledged the uh, two groups, uh, one, the, the, both groups are the expedited, one is the Quick ER or the quicker, and the other one is there is, and both of you have touched a, a very important issue 
and a very important operation that we must change and we must improve. And uh, I believe that we will do so. So we will uh, also push forward your projects. So lots of luck to you as well. Thank you, everybody.